Welcome to part two of Destin Reads, a stupidly long <laughs> court filing about Call of Duty. We're going to continue reading Xbox's comments here, and I hope we get into the part where Xbox tells Sony how to do their job a little bit better, in their opinion. <laughs> anyway, uh, it gets really juicy. Let's dive in right now. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit that subscribe button, hit that bell so you know my content goes live. I really appreciate the support, especially seeing how many people have subscribed since I started doing this. Let's get right back into it. So they continue with their point here on, oh no, on page three of 111. Even if Microsoft were to withdraw or degrade Call of Duty from on PlayStation, they're not doing that. The panel would have to believe that Sony would, as a result of the loss or degradation of one game franchise on its console, go from being the clear market leader for over two decades to being placed at such a disadvantage that its ability to compete is substantially limited. That is not plausible. What they, what they have to prove is that if they buy Activision Blizzard and Call of Duty were to go Xbox exclusive, PlayStation would basically not be able to compete in the market, not have enough money to make any games or just do anything for their customers. We know that's not true. I don't think anybody out there truly believes that were that to happen, PlayStation would just shut its doors and pack up its bags. Will it even the playing field? Yes, absolutely. But is Sony still going to be profitable, profitable at the end of the day? Absolutely they are. They're hugely profitable and they will continue to be. But maybe they could try some of this stuff that Xbox suggests. Sony is roughly equivalent in size to Activision and nearly double the size of Microsoft's game publishing business. Sony publishes iconic first-party franchises such as God of War, Last of Us, Marvel, Spider-Man, Uncharted, Ghost of Tsushima, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Days Gone, as well as recently acquired Destiny 2, and has minority shareholdings in Epic Games, the publisher of Fortnite, and From Software, the publisher of Elden Ring, one of the biggest games of 2022. There were over 280 exclusive first and third-party titles on PlayStation in 2021, nearly five times as many as Xbox. But if Xbox gets Call of Duty, Sony's done. Like, that's Sony's argument, right? Xbox just listed bangers, like amazing games that sold incredibly well. God of War Ragnarok being one of their fastest-selling first-party titles, putting all these others to shame. Um Sony's trying to make it make these regulators believe that if they lose Call of Duty, that they just they can't compete. It's impossible for them to do anything if they're only making a billion dollars instead of one point five billion in profit every year. Sony is profitable. They sell their consoles at a profit. They sell everything at a profit. So like their argument is ridiculous. PlayStation has more than double the monthly active users, close to 60 million more of Xbox. Even if it were to lose all of its Call of Duty gamers, a highly improbable outcome, the PlayStation gamer base would remain significantly larger than Xbox. That's true. Xbox Xbox screwed the pooch in the Xbox One era, and they know it. So they're just putting it all out there. Most gamers on consoles do not play Call of Duty. Xbox gamer data shows that blank percent of Xbox gamers did not play Call of Duty for more than one hour in 2021, and blank percent did not play for more than five hours, even including all gamers who launched a Call of Duty title on their console without imposing the additional requirement of them playing the game at least once in a given year. Blank percent of all Xbox users did not launch Call of Duty at all, but 0% of their total time was spent on Call of Duty. The data shows that PlayStation gamers likely is similar. Call of Duty gamers are neither special nor unique in terms of either their spending or user engagement as compared to gamers that favor other popular franchises. There's other games out there, FIFA, Fortnite, GTA, Minecraft, NBA, Rocket League. They spend the same amount in those franchises as they do uh, proportionally in Call of Duty. So... They're just further shredding apart Sony's argument. Call of Duty does not drive platform adoption. Sorry. Xbox data shows that between 2016 and 2022, only blank percent of gamers played Call of Duty as their first game on their new Xbox console, and some blank percent of new Xbox gamers never played or purchased Call of Duty content. Fortnite is the most common first played game with FIFA, Grand Theft Auto, and numerous other titles being similarly often played first. That's very interesting. 
because what they're saying is Call of Duty isn't a console game. I would guess most Call of Duty players, PC, like Warzone, yes, there's lots of console players playing Call of Duty. So that's definitely a truth. But when you get an Xbox console or a PlayStation console, you're probably firing up uh, FIFA or Grand Theft Auto or some other game like that. Uh, I'm a little surprised that Call of Duty is not up there, but I mean, if that's what Xbox is saying, they're not going to lie to the regulators. That's what the data shows. That's kind of interesting to me, actually. For the vast majority of gamers, Call of Duty is a small component in their overall gaming consumption. Yeah, I play Warzone once in a while, but I mean, I'm definitely in that bucket. Sony is not foreclosed when certain Call of Duty content was exclusive to Xbox. Now, they're talking about the Xbox 360 era when Call of Duty stuff was had exclusive content on the Xbox era. Now, PlayStation has been doing that for years since. I think that's totally fine. I think that's fair business. And Xbox is calling them out on that right now. They're like, hey, you did just fine in the PS3 era when we had exclusive stuff. How come you're worried about us having exclusive stuff again? It shouldn't be that big of a deal. There was no indication based on Call of Duty's prior history of differentiation between versions of Call of Duty on Xbox and PlayStation that this could in any way affect rival consoles' ability to compete effectively. Sony's share of console sales grew in the period from 2005 to 2015 when Xbox had certain exclusive rights. There are many more popular games available in the market in 2022 than there were between 2005 and 2015, including Fortnite, PUBG, Apex, Elden Ring, and many others. If anything, Call of Duty's importance as a franchise was greater in 2005 to 2015. So what they're saying there is, here's, here's the crazy thing. Here's what they're saying. They're saying that during the height of popularity for Call of Duty, PlayStation's user base was growing fast. You remember the 360 PS3 era? Guess who came out on top at the end of that era? The PS3 did. The PS3 ended up selling more consoles. So Xbox is calling them out. They're, they're saying like, when we did exclusive content, your console grew in popularity. When you had the more expensive PlayStation 3 unit, when you didn't have Call of Duty exclusivity, when Elder Scrolls was exclusive to Xbox, what happened to PlayStation? They grew as a company. In my opinion, that comparison to Sony's own uh, analytics destroys any of their narratives about this being any sort of problem. And actually this deal was just approved in another region with no, uh, requirements whatsoever. So it's been approved in three of the places now with no consent decrees or anything. Anyway, continuing on. Similarly, highly successful gaming platforms like Nintendo and Steam have prospered without access to Call of Duty. Nintendo's console business is highly successful without a single version of Call of Duty being available to play on its latest console, the Nintendo Switch. A further example of a platform that has succeeded without Call of Duty is Steam, which is the largest digital storefront with a 40 to 50% share of PC game digital sales in the UK. Absolutely true. Steam has not carried any newly released Activision games for the last three years following Activision's commercial decision to only sell its PC games on Battle.net. This has not affected Steam's leading position. Steam's a little bit of an unfair comparison, in my opinion. Steam is the platform that people play PC stuff on. So Call of Duty choosing not to be there is very much a decision where Activision just said, we know people will download our launcher to play Call of Duty on PC. So... We're not paying you that 30% cut that Steam gets on all sales. It is therefore inherently implausible that withholding or degrading one game could have a foreclosing effect on downstream console competition, i.e. the sense that it could undermine an applicable extent to an, a, a, uh, sorry, to an appreciable extent the ability of Sony to remain competitive going forward. Again, reiterating the point that Sony is going to be just fine. They also touch on Game Pass here. Multi-game subscription services are a means of payment, not a market. Uh, I think it's a growth market. I put a disagree note here. I think that subscription services like Sony's, like Xbox's, are going to continue to grow as the years come. I, th I think it's going to explode, actually. The evidence is consistent with gamers uh, perceiving subscription as buy to play purely as alternative payment methods to access to the same content. Absolutely agree. I don't think any gamer out there uh, thinks of a subscription model as lesser when they're getting to play those games, right? It's just like, what can I compare it to? 
when I subscribed to Gamefly back in the day, right, I was still getting those games. I would play them, then I would return them. The only difference is I don't own them. These days, because I stay subscribed to Game Pass, because I want to play like one game a month, I get my values worth and then some, right? The, the thing is, that's how people think. Am I getting the best value I possibly can? And a lot of people feel like they are with that deal. Um, so let's continue on. And then I need to break this up again, but without the merger, Activision content would not be available on multi-game subscription services. So without it, it's not going to happen. It is actually on PlayStation plus extra already, but anyway, the merger can therefore not make competitive conditions worse under any circumstances. Activision does not make its games, including call of duty available in any meaningful sense to any multi-game subscription services, nor is there any evidence that this is likely to change in the foreseeable future. It is therefore not plausible possible that Activision games are an important input for subscription services or that such services could be foreclosed by not having access to them post merger Activision ordinary Activision's ordinary course, internal business documents, as well as the sworn testimony from its executives. One second. I had the air is like really hot in here has made clear that there are no plans to do so in the future absent the merger. And I, this, this seems like a pro Sony argument. Activision is concerned that participation in subscription services could impact its blank and would lead to brand dilution and cannibalization of buy to play sales, especially of new releases. This reflects Activision view that even if a subs the subscription business model were to glow, grow the blank, they cut out like the whole sentence. This has been a fundamental impediment to publishers more generally agreeing to place their content on subscription services, a stance which is not going to change in the future. That seems like a pro Sony argument to me, and it's weird that Microsoft would even mention this. So basically what they're saying is, uh, game creators don't wanna put their games on subscription service services because they worry it will degrade the quality. Well. Isn't that actually giving Sony and the regulators ammunition by saying that? I don't know why their lawyers would write that. That's very strange to me. So they're saying by purchasing us, we can put them on the subscription service and the content won't be diluted or uh, cause brand dilution or reduce sales or whatever. Yeah, so that's that's strange <laughs> for them to put that in there. Anyway, uh, Let's finish this segment and then I'll do the next part. Even if Microsoft could, in theory, foreclose PlayStation Plus, it would have no effect on competition because Microsoft's Game Pass and PlayStation Plus are primarily and predominantly a way to access games on their respective consoles. The largest subscription service on consoles, PlayStation Plus, ironically, <laughs> X Xbox just told us that PlayStation Plus has more uh, subscribers than Xbox does. So... Just a little piece of data there that maybe was missed. Simply put, Microsoft cannot foreclose Sony's competing multi-game subscription service PlayStation Plus because PlayStation Plus is primarily and predominant, predominantly available on Sony's PlayStation console, where Microsoft's own subscription service Game Pass is not available. This is super interesting. It's a good point. How can Microsoft foreclose on a service that isn't available on their ecosystem? Xbox isn't available on PlayStation. PlayStation isn't available on Xbox. So what's the concern there exactly? It, it, it's impossible to foreclose something if it's not available on the platform to begin with. So kind of interesting point about Game Pass. Because of PlayStation's dominant position, it is equally irrational to consider that such conduct would have an indirect effect, namely that fewer people would buy Sony's PlayStation consoles because PlayStation Plus has hypothetically become less attractive compared to Game Pass. Uh, yep, it's a ridiculous argument on Sony's part. So like, why would they make that argument? It's it's just so strange. They don't do day and day releases anyway. So if that's available on Xbox, that's not something Sony would have made a deal for anyway. It wouldn't have happened on the Sony platform ever. They want that $70 cut that they get, right? Further, even if Microsoft succeeds in growing Game Pass with the addition of Call of Duty, the CMA also would have to satisfy itself that Sony could not respond through investments or improvements in its own service. We're going to stop there because I'm going to do the next video where 
<laughs> uh, Xbox tells Sony how to do their job because I know what's coming and it's really, really good. That's the juicy part. So apologies for the intro here. Largely, we just talk about them continuing to shred the idea that Call of Duty going to Xbox would be bad in any way. It doesn't really, the more I read this, the less it makes sense to me too. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button, hit that bell until when my content goes live. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much to the members for supporting this content. I also appreciate you. If you want to become a member, click that join button. It's like right, it's right there. Where's the arrow? There it is. Ding. It's right down there. I think they changed the layout, so I'm going to have to redo this, this little video I made. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, everybody. I'm going to get out of here, and I'll see you for the next one.